as a, a young film fan, you know, genre film fan growing up, I, I was, uh, like many of us at the time, I was uh, enthralled anytime there was a cool stop motion animation shot in a movie. And uh, if they were in the trailer, uh, that just meant, okay, I've got to gotta watch this movie. So growing up as a little, little kid in the late 50s, looking at some of the amazing Ray Harryhausen films, uh, falling in love with movies like uh, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and Jason and the Argonauts, uh, in the back of my head is like, well, one day if, um, if I'm able to and I'm making movies, I've got to do some of that stop motion animation. Now remember, this is at a time when there was no CGI. Um, these were, these were in-camera physical effects that they may look a little retro, to some, but um, you know, they, they, it wasn't a painted image. They didn't go in there and create a cartoony image, which is what you know is being done today. So, uh, as a young kid growing up in the '50s and '60s, anything stop motion a animation was like awesome. I met David Allen. You know, I don't have the perfect memory of exactly how we connected. But um, I had already, by the late 70s, had made six or seven movies. Uh, had this idea for a movie called Laser Blast. It required some stop motion animation little creatures, or not little, but you know, aliens. And um, I, I knew of Dave Allen, I, I guess through a friend. He had a, a cool studio in the valley, uh, in Burbank. And I don't remember exactly how I connected with him, but I just know one day I'm at his studio. I met his crew, and his crew, I wish I remember all the names, but they've all since then become, you know, huge Academy Award winning wizards of uh, special effects. Dennis Muren is one of them, and the other names I, I'm afraid I forget. But I met Dave, and, you know, Dave was just a, you know, very passionate, very quiet, very erudite young guy, and uh, he had already done some movies. He was doing uh, Pillsbury Doughboy commercials. And I said, look, David, I'm, you know, low budget. I, I have very little money, but I, I have these scenes that I needed, these alien dudes for laser blast. I gave him the script and I told him what I could afford. And, you know, remember that every four or five second shot uh, of a stop motion animation creature usually took a week. I mean, aside from the very expensive, um, you know, armature that needs to be inside the puppet. And that was thousands of dollars and the sculpture of the puppet or the creature. Um, ultimately, when it was set up, whether it was a back screen or however they did it, whatever was required, then it was one frame at a time. And somehow I pulled it off. I, I don't know where I found the money, but Dave Allen agreed to, um, you know, to the price, which was you know, a fair price, but not like big studio numbers. And that was the first time that I, I entered into a deal with Dave, and I remember Get being so excited the first uh, to see that first stop motion animation shot um, because it took I want to think it took like a month or two after we did the deal and money was paid because they had to sculpt the thing they had to do the armature the movie had to be shot they had to do all this hocus pocus so I remember finally it was the week they were going to shoot their first shot and I mean I could not wait to look at these four seconds or five seconds. And we, we met in a screening room, and I forget if it was Deluxe Film Labs, it was one of the labs, to literally screen four or five seconds. So I said, Dave, put it on a loop at least. This is 35 millimeters. So after the driving and parking, we're just nothing go whoop, and it's gone, which he did. And we watched it. I mean, I just couldn't get enough of it. It was just so magical and so cool. And I knew that that shot was going to, uh, uh, you know, in addition to a kind of a neat weirdo movie, make, make, make its mark. So. I don't know how many shots we did, 12, 14, 13, someone can count them, I guess, but they became an integral part of Laser Blast, and the movie came out and did well and became sort of a, uh, you know, a cult fan favorite, um, and we're actually uh, just released it on Blu-ray, and I have a whole vintage VHS idea that I'm thinking about doing, which will include, uh, this packaging will include the, uh, the, uh, the alien uh, creature as other Movies will include puppets or dolls or whatever is you know germane to the movie. But yeah, it was uh, it was a great experience meeting Dave and and doing that first movie. And I was hooked. I just knew if if, if I could afford it, you know, I, I put stop motion animation in every movie, which of course I couldn't. Nor did every every movie call for it. But that was the beginning of the relationship, which I think was 1977. Richard, 
David's approach, uh, and I remember this well because we worked together for many, many years, uh, was very pragmatic. Um, rarely did I see him at least visually excited. He was very even keel sort of guy. Um, I, I've seen him upset sometimes or, or frustrated. Um, but even in, in those moments, he was very controlled. But he was a very methodical, um, it's, oh, I mean, I say this in a loving way, but he almost, it's like everything he did was almost one frame at a time. You know, his thinking, the way he plotted things out, the way he talked. He wasn't one of those, you know, fast talking, you know, super excitable Hollywood dudes. I mean, he could have been, you know, a surgeon. The process in making these movies um, was always making the movie first. Sometimes, of course, we needed to know what the plan was, what the plot was, what the where the creatures would be in there, and David was very good at doing storyboards, so if the characters needed to, um, you know, be in a scene or be part of the scene, that was very well plotted out. Uh, it's interesting that in Laser Blast, it was kind of easy in the sense that they always um, came alive in their own little set, where there was the desert, um, you know, uh, in the alien spaceship, when they decided to turn around and go back to Earth because they you know, they're very clever, but they lost the frickin' laser blast gun. And uh, and then at the end, they're on the top of the building blowing stuff up. So that was a little more compartmentalized, whereas uh, movies like The Daytime Ended, which followed shortly thereafter, and other movies later um, it really required very careful plotting and, and knowing where people are looking and where the aliens are. But the actual photography, uh, the stop motion photography, was all done after we, we did, we finished production, which was, practically speaking, uh, frustrating and difficult because, you know, even today you make a movie, you have a certain amount of money tied up, you want to get it out to market, and usually once you complete photography on a movie, 60 days later, if you move quickly, quick enough, or 90 days later, the movie's done. Well, then began the process of waiting for these stop-motion animation shots, which sometimes took half a year. Some of the most amazing uh, characters uh, are in a movie that no one's seen yet called The Primevals. The Primevals was sort of the dream of Dave, and I wanted to make that dream happen, and we shot that in the 90s. It was Full Moon's most expensive movie. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, you know, about two-thirds of the way through all the stop-motion work after the film was shot, David passed away. I definitely intend to get that movie finished, but in that movie there are these awesome lizard creatures, there's the sort of star of the movie, this Yeti, um, uh, which again, once the movie is released, hopefully soon, hopefully next year, you'll all kind of know what I'm talking about. So, and then there were some great characters in Dolls. Um, a picture that we did with Stuart Gordon, uh, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but those are probably the ones that come to mind as the as, as characters created by Dave that were the, that were really the coolest and that have you know stood the test of time. <coughs> I do miss stop motion in general. I, I, I don't think, other than finishing Primeval's, um, there'll ever be a, a you know a time when I'll say you know I'm not going to be like Tim Burton and trying to do a, a picture in this. You know, the, almost in the year 2020, you know, in stop motion animation, it's pretty much a lost art. Very few people, um, you know, have, know how to do it, I think, anymore. It's very cost prohibitive. Um, you know, some of the great stop motion guys went on to do, you know, work in, in the current CGI effects world. Uh, what I love about stop motion, even though you can look at some of the Harry House and stuff, and it's kind of, you know, they, they move in a certain way, is I know that I'm looking at a real three-dimensional character. It's not, a, it's not a cartoon. And yeah, there's some amazing work in CGI. Sometimes I look at some of these, even though it's very repetitive, there seems to be a drag in every movie and all that stuff's going on. But a lot of it's very well done, but there's something about stop motion animation that, and maybe it's just because, you know, as a little kid, I looked at Jason and the Argonauts and Seven Forges Sinbad, and I was into all that, that has its own unique magic. And that sort of is, the way I feel about you know all these puppet and doll movies I'm making, uh, there's a lot of shortcuts that I don't do because I really like working with the real creature, you know, in the room with the actors. I don't like to dial it in later because no matter what, I get the feeling the actors, as good as they are, they're they're fighting a light bulb or they're fighting, they're doing something that later on is dialed in as a CGI character. Plus, a lot of CGI for me is very cartoony, and. Um, it, 
uh, case in point, you know, we had a big budget on robot jocks, which we had a fraction of that for Robot Wars. But I think Robot Wars has some great scenes, and those are all stop motion animation, amazing, articulated, built, um, you know, special effects characters. And, you know, when you watch that and you look at it, there, there's a certain reality, even though it's stop motion and it may move a little weird, that I just don't see in these big, massively expensive, uh, overextended, bloated, like Pacific Rim movies. I mean, they're beautifully done, and you, you know, you, you can't fault them for, for, you know, a lot of amazing work. But I still feel I'm looking a bit of a, a, like a video game or a cartoon. I don't really feel as I think people do feel if they look at Robot Jocks, which was probably the best of the movies we've made with giant robots. That film made. I don't know how many, 25 years ago, a long time ago, I think really holds its own because it just seems more real and more fantastic than big cartoon robots.